Well, welcome back. Welcome back to this, our 48th show, Palestine Deep Dive. Uh, every time uh, we meet, we take a special and long look at uh, issues in the Middle East, but with a specific focus on Palestine, Israel, Palestine. We want to speak to as many of you uh, as possible. We'd like to hear from you, of course. Um, uh, and uh, we're delighted, of course, today to be uh, joined by Buddha Hassan. And I'll introduce Buddha to you shortly. You'll Many of you will remember her from when she's appeared on our previous shows. And we're delighted to have you with us uh, today, Buddha. My name's Mark Seddon. Um, I used to work for Al Jazeera Television as a UN correspondent. I subsequently went on to work for the United Nations and for former Secretary General uh, of the United Nations, uh, Ban Ki-moon. Um, but today, Badur is with us. Uh, thank you for joining us, Badur. Badur uh, is a Palestinian writer, of course, and a legal researcher at Jerusalem Legal Aid and Human Rights Center. And of course, that gives her a very special a view uh, of what is happening, uh, a special understanding and appreciation uh, and an ability to report and tell us uh, what is actually happening on the ground uh, around her. So we're very grateful uh, to you, Badur, and we also would very much like to hear from you uh, this evening. Um, we're going to have a, a real focus, as you know, today on what is being termed by uh, many organizations, uh, many individuals, uh, global opinion increasingly, as uh, ethnic cleansing uh, in uh, the Palestinian territories. Uh, of course, many have been arguing this has been happening for decades, but it's possibly uh, in, the, in, the, in the wake of the recent uh, report by Amnesty International, it's one of those issues that is becoming much more widely talked about, it seems, and it seems in particular that there's a real focus because we can see for ourselves through social media, uh, through reporting, through citizen journalists on the ground, what is happening in Jerusalem, what is happening in the West Bank uh, and elsewhere. Um, and if the mainstream media decides that there are more important things to be reporting on or simply ignores, uh, and, and by the way, we should just say in passing, the New York Times is now, I think, but uh, 18 days without even mentioning Amnesty International's report, uh, which said that Israel was practicing apartheid. And this is despite the fact that Amnesty International USA uh, made us made the report as well. I made it publicly available. 18 days. There's a lesson for you about mainstream media and this, this is very strong editorializing. But look, before we t turn to this main issue that we want to discuss today, I thought it might just be worth seeing what Badur makes of uh, a situation whereby, uh, for instance, <clears throat> we are seeing before us uh, uh, a, a major crisis uh, between Russia and Ukraine, between Russia and the West. And we have seen in the past couple of days the decision by the Russian president and by the Russian parliament to um, recognize two breakaway regions of eastern Ukraine. Uh, and uh, also we are seeing reports that uh, military uh, equipment is being moved into these same areas. This um, annexation, effectively, it's being described as, has been described uh, and condemned by the UN Secretary General. But interestingly enough, many of these people who are many making quite strong statements about this issue, and fair enough, don't seem to be saying the same things about another occupation uh, that has been going on for 50 years uh, in the Golan Heights. But do, I wonder, from where you're sitting, uh, you see what's happening at, in eastern Ukraine, and you have seen, you've been living with, with this occupation, but specifically with Golan Heights, which was an invasion or occupation of territory that belongs to Syria, and yet nobody's talking about sanctions <laughs> against Israel Nobody ever has for doing that. Why is this? Why this inconsistency? Mark, if you permit me, I will shift a little bit to your question. I think your question is very timely about the Golan for two reasons. First, this month, February, marks the 40th anniversary of an open-ended 
a strike that the Syrians in the Golan in 1982, to be precise, on the 14th of February 1982 staged. It lasted for five months, and this strike was against an Israeli law that imposed Israeli citizenship on Syrians in the Golan. The Syrian Golan had been occupied in 1967. Israel ethnically cleansed the Syrian Golan, depopulating 95% of its original uh, Syrian citizens, turning them into refugees. Of the 138,000 Syrians who had lived in the Golan in 1967, only some 6,000 remained. And of course, Israel destroyed most of the villages and farms in the Golan and confiscated its land. Only six villages remained, four of them Druze, Syrian Druze villages. In the years that followed, Israel started building settlements, starting extracting the resources of the Golan and consolidating con its occupation. Until in 1981, it annexed it unilaterally annexed the Golan and tried to impose Israeli citizenship on the Syrian Arab Druze who lived in the Golan. The Syrians refused that and staged this massive open-ended strike that again lasted for five months and which managed to force Israel to thwart its attempt to uh, impose Israeli citizenship on the Golan. So the Golan residents have permanent residency. And since 1982, they continue to resist Israel attempts to Judaize the Golan. Uh, the other reason why your question is so timely is because last December, just last December, on the 40th anniversary of Israel's unilateral annexation of the Golan, uh, Israel approved, the Israeli cabinet approved a plan to double the number of Israeli Jewish colonists in the Golan. It is a $300 million plan, according to which by 2030, the number of Israeli colonists living in the Golan would be doubled from some 25,000 to 50,000, in addition to all the budgets that will be allocated to supporting the uh, internal uh, colonization of uh, Israeli Jews to the Golan. It's a continuation of uh, many projects that Israel is leading in the Golan, including extractivism, including theft of Syrian resources, including exploitation of water, of fruit, including a huge wind farm project that Israel is planning and trying to implement in the Golan on the land, on the Syrian lands of the land, preventing people from Syrians from constructing, from expanding. And the thing about the occupation in the Golan, Mark, is that it's a type of violence that is so invisible and so slow because it's not, say, as visible or as crude as the violence perpetrated in the West Bank. So people think that life goes on as normal, but it's mm. not. Syrians in the Golan have been uh, imprisoned by Israel, have been repressed by Israel. They have been separated from their Syrian families. You have to go to a hill known as the shouting mm. hill for Syrians in the Golan to connect with their families that live are living in Syria hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees who are still living in Syria, internally displaced to Syria, can never go back to their lands in the Golan, mm -hmm. while Israeli Jews are being incentivized in order to colonize the Golan, not to mention all the tourism that Israel conducts in the Golan and the wineries. And apparently, all those who are calling for boycotting Russian products which is fine, they have no problem with boycotting uh, and, and they, they would never call for boycotting all the wine and the fruits being produced by Israeli colonies and by Israeli mm -hmm. companies in the Golan have absolutely no problem well, with extra. Do it if, if I may, I mean, t today in the uh, yeah. British Parliament, uh, there was a vote and a debate that uh, was aimed at stopping elected local authorities from um, adopting policies that were uh, in line with the boycott and divestment and sanctions campaign. In other words, to stop local authorities from perhaps a contract giving contracts to companies that operated in the occupied territories. Um, but at the same time, these same MPs, these very much the, exactly the same members of parliament were calling for sanctions against Russia. The hypocrisy is quite extraordinary. And I was very interested to hear what you were saying about um Golan and the uh, the the divide there because I went there myself from the Syrian side and I went mm. through the town of Kenetra which as you know is still destroyed um, and then I was able to go to that mountain that you described um, where the only way that people could communicate from families that have been split for 50 years through this occupation was as you say 
shouting across this great ravine, across these across these fences. Uh, it was very, very shocking. Uh, but look, before we move on, Buddha, there's a Maya uh, has just got in touch, and, and uh, this is in relation to the New York Times, which is now in its 18th day of failing to report that Amnesty International um, produced that extremely powerful report saying that Israel was guilty of apartheid. And Maya says, we watchers and fellow activists could post the Amnesty International report in the replies on, for example, the New York Times. Good idea. Uh, let's see how long it takes the New York Times I to... I do have subscriptions. That, so that, that, have subscriptions that the New York Times can do that. <laughs> I wouldn't need to have subscription for the New York Times. <laughs> yes, you have to pay for the subscription, but but it's well well worth trying, Maya, because of course you probably remember something similar was happening here at the Guardian um, before the Amnesty International report. When um, those of us who were saying that uh, Bishop Tutu very valiantly campaigned against um, apartheid, not only in South Africa but also in Israel, um, we of course, um, as you know, uh, were, uh, were were censored. Uh, now here we have this is. Uh, I don't know if you can see New York Times. This is the New York Times blackout of the Amnesty Apartheid report. It continues. Look, well, look. Thank you for that. Let's let's um, move on um, because, but uh, whilst the Western media, in particular, and the focus internationally has been on Ukraine, um, we have over the past week been seeing some quite shocking um, events unfolding in Jerusalem. Uh, to many people known as the Holy City. Uh, we're not really seeing a great deal of reporting in the media of this, but we do see a lot of it on social media. And of course, but where you are, you are more familiar than any of us as to what's going on. But um, but for, but in Jerusalem, Israeli authorities are still attempting to remove a Palestinian family from their home. It's been their home for 70 years and to hand this home over to Jewish settlers. And the family are called the Salem's, the Salem family, and they've lived in this home uh, in the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah for all of that time. And um, if this eviction goes ahead, uh, 12 members of this family, including uh, children, half of the 12 are children, will be homeless. Um, can you do you know this family? But do, why, why, are they, why are they being picked on? Why, why are they why in particular? Uh, are they having their house uh, stolen? So I, I think you, most of us are familiar with the case that erupted last year with the families in uh, Karmel Jaouni area, including the Kurd family and other families in Sheikh Jarrah that were threatened with displacement. And this relates to all the whole agreement with UNRWA, their refugees who leased this land and who built on this land. Now, Sheikh Jarrah is divided in, there is another part in Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, in this uh, part, in, commonly known as Um Harun part, where uh, Salem family live and other families live. It's a similar claim, it's a different legal claim in a sense because there's no UNRWA involvement here. But it's uh, it's an area where uh, there are uh, Jewish family that claim ownership of some land before 19 of, and houses before 1948, and you have also Palestinian refugee. The Salem family is a Palestinian refugee family for, that was displaced in Jaffa in 1948 uh, and sought refuge in the eastern bar, part of occupied Jerusalem and moved to Sheikh Jarrah in 1951. Uh, in 19, after the annexation of the eastern part of occupied Jerusalem in 1967 and the enactment of the legal and administrative matters law in 1970, which allowed Israelis to claim land that they had allegedly owned before 1948 in the eastern part of Jerusalem, even though they were compensated by the Israeli occupation authorities by having uh, alternative lands in the western part of occupied occupied Jerusalem. The heirs of these, uh, how, the, the alleged Jewish heirs of these houses sold part of their uh, share of the land to this uh, Israeli uh, member of the municipal council, Yonatan Yosef, and others, and including a Jewish and a, um, radical Jewish nationalists. In 90, actually, in 1988, the decision the Israeli court took the final decision to displace the Salem family. For different reasons, the decision was not implemented. 
But very recently, the Israeli uh, Department of Implementation and Enforcement decided to implement and enforce this decision to displace the, the, the Salem family. But, uh, can, can, I, can, can I come in there? Because a, a lot of people watching this would be thinking, well, OK, so there's a, been a dispute over the ownership of this house. Um, and perhaps the, it, the, you know, the, 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 the family there are, are renters. Um, uh, but if they are renters, could they not be allowed to re-rent the place they're renting in? And how is it, if they are renters and they are being driven out of this uh, house, how is it that uh, what, what is effectively, it seems to many people being a, a racist decision is being made, that only, um, only a Jewish family can move in to replace them. That doesn't seem to be fair or make sense at all. And by the way, I, I, another question that people are asking, because we've seen pictures of this guy, there's a there's a there's a there's a guy who's camped out on their lawn. He's called Itamar Ben Givia, I think is his name. Yes. I think we might have a picture of him uh, camping out on their lawn. Um, Sorry, what's going on there? Everyone, it's, it seems bizarre. What, what is going on there, Budur? Can you yeah, explain? Because, because on the other hand, you have the absentee property law, Mark, which was enacted by Israel in 1951, which prohibits internally displaced Palestinian and Palestinian refugees who were uprooted from their land of ever trying to claim back their land. So a refugee family that was displaced in Jaffa in 1948 can't come and say, but we have a land, we have, we have documents, we have proof that we own this house in Jaffa, let us go back to our house. A Palestinian family that was displaced from Western Jerusalem in 1948 and have documents that prove their ownership of the land, of the house, can't say until the JNF bring back, we want back our home, which is now occupied by Israelis. So you have one law that allows alleged Israeli owners of claiming back property, while you have a law, another law, the absentee property which declares Palestinians effectively as absentees that have absolutely no right over their land and this is what Palestinians say we are refugees from Jaffa from Western Jerusalem from other and from Haifa and we want our property back and it's something that Israel does not allow instead what Israel tries to do is try to portray it as some sort of a, a dispute over property, over real estate, when it's not, when it's the whole objective of this is actually to displace all of the Palestinians in Sheikh Jarrah, especially in those two areas, and to plant on the, in their place these Israeli colonists. And the visit of Ben Gvir, which you, whom you asked me about, I think Ben Gvir is a bit of a clown in a sense, or he tries to look like a clown. He is obviously dangerous. He's, he's a member of a party called Ortsmai Yehudit or Jewish Power Party, part of the uh, Jewish, the Zionist nationalist movement in Israel. But why, why do I say that he's a clown? Because he's the crude face of this project. He's the one who makes all the trouble. He doesn't seem to be politically correct. He, he is not really liked, popular by, uh, neither in the opposition, really, the, the so-called opposition, nor by the so-called, funnily called change government, which is anything but change, only change to what the worst, actually. But he kind of is, is too crude. But I say he's, he's the crude, he's the ugly face of a project. But there are subtler people like him, like mm -hmm. the court, for example, the, the Israeli magistrate's court delayed or froze the eviction of the Salem family, the displacement of the Salem family, in order to buy time, in order to to see that there is a movement brewing in the street and they're trying to pacify it, to end it, to put an end to it, to wait for a more appropriate time to co carry out the displacement in the dark without making so much fuss. Ben Gvir comes and says, I want to make fuss. I want to grab attention. But there are those who think more smartly in the Israeli establishment, including the police who say, we want to carry on the displacement. We, we, we are not different. We don't differ over the strategy and the long term strategy is the displacement of Palestinians, even if it's a displacement at inst on installments, but it's a displacement of Palestinians and the Judaizations of Sheikh Jarrah. But one party wants to carry it so crudely, so violently, so fast. The other that thinks strategically, think we have time as the establishment, as the powerful party in the game, we have time, we can wait. So let's wait for the appropriate time. And this mm -hmm. is why it's so important for people to be 
on the alert all the time. Israel will try to displace the family after Ramadan, for instance. This is just freezing. The final decision was taking freezing. The eviction doesn't mean canceling it. It only means that they have more time to think about an appropriate when the time is more right to do it. If I may, you recently had a high-level delegation of um, U.S. lawmakers uh, to Jerusalem, including Nancy Pelosi. Mm -hmm. uh, did she was she taken to Sheikh Jarrah? Was, did, was, did people show her what was going on, or was was she not allowed to see, or was she not interested? I mean, do you know what happened there? We think that there was one Israeli activist who kind of took her, probably, or lawyer who took her on an alternative tour, or who showed her supposedly the other face of the reality. But ridiculously, after I think one of the one of these delegates, one of the delegations said, "I talked to Palestinians in the West Bank, and they said." We wanted less checkpoints. Look, Palestinians want less apartheid. It's less checkpoints. And, and, and if this is the conviction, if this is the conclusion that they managed to reach after the visit, that no, Palestinians don't want an end to the cage that they live in. They just want, want the cage to look more beautiful, to look prettier with less checkpoints, to have it more, to have the, to, to keep the occupation going, but with less checkpoints. I think this is a, this is not a very smart conclusion, if I may. Uh, but uh, but regardless, I think we all know where the establishment of the United States Democratic Party mm. stands when it comes to... Look, but uh, okay, can, I, can I ask too, I mean, th there isn't anything new about these tactics, is there? Because in Hebron, I think it's, a, it's been a similar situation for some years now. A very small group of Israeli settlers um, managed to get uh, the legal title of a building um, and then the, there is the beginning of a process of essentially trying to force out um, Palestinians. And so this is yet another uh, instance. Um, so it's been going on for some time. But but what, a question that I've got really is with the Salem family, um, if eventually they are driven out from their home um, under this uh, under this legislation that you were describing to us earlier, does that mean they can never find another home anywhere in historic Palestine, what happens to them? Just as this, just as a one family, because they're an example, what happens to them? There was a family that was displaced a couple of few years ago, and they actually had to leave Jerusalem to live in the West Bank. And this is part of the thing that Israel wants to drive Palestinians out of Jerusalem and to force them, the Shamas <clears throat> family, I, I'm talking about and to force them out of Jerusalem entirely. And that's the thing, although the individual private plight of the Salem family is so important because it's not just the big picture, it's about families, but it's one family at a time. This is important to remember. Mm -hmm. that the, the Salem family, just as the families before that, will only be the start if the displacement of the Salem family goes and unchallenged, if it succeeds. And we remember that we still have the cases pending in the court. And we remember that we can't, as Palestinians, we can't count on any sort of justice coming out of Israeli courts because we know that the system is rigged. The system is entrenchedly and inherently built in order to favor and prevent the claim of Israeli colonists. We have the different families whose cases, the seven families whose cases are still pending before the Israeli Supreme Court, having the families having refused the compromise that was suggested to them, which um, basically meant acknowledging the ownership of the settlers, and the families refused to acknowledge the uh, ownership of the settlers in their over their land. And so still they're still waiting for the decision by the Supreme Court. But as I said, it's it's one family at the time and the important thing is that Palestinians are aware of it and this is why they, they know that it's while the Salim family is uh, Fatme, Fatme Salim, the 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 matriarch of the family is everyone's mother in a sense but they know that she is not the only one she knows that she is not the sole target of this but uh, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, um, with almost with reference to that Amnesty International report again and um, apartheid uh, in South Africa, um, there was this policy they used to call it. You'll be familiar with this of forced removals. And it mm -hmm. does sound as though the policy is very much the same. And I've, I remember going to Cape Town many years ago 
and being told about how certain districts were essentially after apartheid was brought in properly in 1948. Um, essentially, people were removed, forcibly removed from districts. Uh, and it was done on a huge scale. Uh, District 6, which you'll probably be familiar with, there was a wonderful play musical written about District 6 when I went there. All that were left were, in fact, synagogues and mosques and churches, um, because all of the fantastic multiracial, multi ethnic population that had lived there had just been cleared out and put into townships and segregated. And um, I suppose it's it's beyond Sheikh Jarrah now because, you know, our understanding is it's not just a family here and a family there, but there appears to be a sort of grand design to essentially move whole districts of people out. Uh, Hundreds and also, of families. Hundreds. What, what, is, what is the plan? Is there a, is there a broader plan that it happens? Maybe not this piecemeal, you know, but it's happening. It's a broader plan. We're talking about hundreds of families, mainly in Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah, but it's not through forcible eviction. We have to remember that there are other layers. It's, it's a multi-layered system in a sense because you have also all these forced demolitions and this creation. There was it was known as a 2020 plan. Of course, it was not. It had not. They, they, they failed to implement it by 2020, whose aim was to reduce Palestinians in Jerusalem to less than 30 percent. Right now, Palestinians constitute 38% of the population in Jerusalem. So the objective was to reduce that percentage to less than 30% through the use of several methods, including forcible eviction, forcible displacement, demolitions, refusal to grant building permits, and annexing the municipal or uh, uh, larger settlement blocks, uh, creating a settlement, a metropolitan, a Jerusalem metropolitan that is mainly with the settlement of Ma'ali Adumim near Jerusalem, and also excluding two huge, two overcrowded neighborhoods in Jerusalem from the municipal boundaries of the occupied Jerusalem municipality. In addition to all sorts of plans like national, and we'll talk probably about it, declaring areas and as national parks, etc. So there is definitely a project. It's just that since 1967, with the confiscations, massive land confiscation, that started in 1967. We have been seeing a gradual process to do in Jerusalem what Israel had done after occupying Palestine in 1948 in so many other towns and villages. Uh, the thing is because of Palestinian resistance, and this is something that we always have to keep in mind, that one of the reasons why this project has failed to materialize as quickly as Israel had wanted to mm -hmm. It too is because of Palestinian resistance to it. That Palestinians didn't simply say yes and knelt and kneel. They actually remained on their land despite the difficulty of living on, in Jerusalem, despite the challenging and, and the really challenging condition, despite the fact that you really live under this instant and constant threat of losing your home, your house, living as this precarious residency status that Palestinians have in Jerusalem as permanent residence, a status that can be revoked at any time. But despite the precariousness, the vulnerability and the fragility of their status, Palestinians somehow are still clinging to this life. And this is so not a cliche, Mark. This is the reality of life. This is the embodiment of Palestinian resistance in the city. This this is what has made or forced Israel to slow down its process. Mm -hmm. Slow down, yes, but Israel is continuing it. And the threat facing hundreds of families, especially in Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah, led by, uh, by uh, settlement groups funded and supported directly by the government, like the city of David Ilad and Lahlat Shimon in Sheikh Jarrah Ilad in Silwan, are just a testament to this attempt of uh, speeding up this forcible displacement process in Jerusalem. Well, Buddha, there's a couple of um, questions that have come in. Um, one from uh, Jim in Denver in the United States. And Jim uh, asks, uh, is it true that Sheikh Jarrah has been under siege recently with roads being blocked off? How on earth does Israel justify this? And uh, Natasha in Manchester asks, does Amnesty's recent report confirming what Palestinians have said for decades that Israel is practicing the crime of apartheid give any hope to the families of Sheikh Jarrah? Regarding the first question, yes, Israel has blocked 
uh, entrances to, uh, especially to the area where uh, Fatmi Salem's family home is located. So in order to enter, people have to go all through all sorts of complicated routes. They can't go through the normal route. But this is something that we already saw last May when Israel did the same blockade, the same siege against the Kurd family, against the other families in Karmel Jaouni in, in, in Sheikh Jarrah. So yes, in a sense, there is there are massive freedom of movement restrictions facing Israel justifies it by saying that we want to maintain protect security but we saw what security what protecting security looks like when they attacked Muhammad al Ajlouni and will probably allow me Mark to talk about this case is, is uh, this the young is this the young lad who's got Down syndrome yes Yes. Yes. Uh, shocking. I mean, many of you who are watching probably have seen this on social media, the video, which we were debating earlier whether to, to show uh, again if you hadn't seen it. But we thought probably not. It's very, very disturbing. Disturbing indeed. Um, yes, this young man, right, but, I, you know, Boudou, so please tell yeah. us more. Yeah, just I want just a minute to actually tell uh, our listeners and viewers that Muhammad is so much more than just the Down syndrome. He's a larger than life presence in the protests in Jerusalem. He's so courageous. He is popular and loved by all those who attend protests, whether in Sheikh Jarrah or in Damascus Gate. His arresting laugh, his smile, the way he chants, the way he leads the chants, the way he comes and pats you on the shoulders when you are start to chant, and then how he distribute, distributes waters and water and flowers for protesters. And it's just his presence and his voice and his courage. And, and then, of course, he also has Down syndrome, which is part of who he is, but it doesn't define who he is. And here in the protest, he feels like he's popular, he's embraced, he's not bullied, he's, he's appreciated for what he is. Uh, he reminds me uh, of this uh, song about score not his simplicity and rather love him all the more. And we do love him all the more because it is it, he is one of the icons, really, of the movement and, and, and on the ground in Sheikh Jarrah. And this is what makes the assault on him all the more galling, not just because he has got Down syndrome, but also partly but because they know that he, he's got Down syndrome and he, they intentionally and deliberately attacked him. Uh, and this is just goes to show the cruelty and the brutality of the Israeli police, which is not surprising, really. It's not the first time. We all remember the case of the execution of Iyad al-Halaq, a Palestinian also with cognitive disability who was executed by Israel two years ago. So it's not physical disability, not co nor cognitive disability will spare you from the wrath of the Israeli army. It's just, for me, it was very important to say that Muhammad al is so much more than just being captured or defined by his cognitive disability but nothing really protects you when you are on the street and protesting and calling for your rights there is nothing that will stop the Israeli army or police from attacking you what's happened to him Boudou, and why was he arrested he was not arrested. He, he wasn't was arrested attacked. Israel claimed that he was chanting uh, inciting chants uh, ridiculously enough he was, of course, chanting, but they, I mean, they attacked him simply because he was chanting. Uh, thankfully, the other protesters and his family members and, and friends protected him from being arrested. Uh, so he was not arrested and he will continue. He will receive all the love and support that he, he will. He knows how much he is loved. And I think he's part of the community. And it's so important that the, the protests mark, it's, it's something that people think that protests Protests is simply only confrontation with Israel. It is, these protests are confrontation with Israel, but they're also a way, a space for a Palest the Palestinian community to gather, to share, to chant, to, to sing, to actually build the community. That it's something that Israel has prohibited and prevented us from doing. And Palestinian community is so diverse. It has all these diversities, whether in physical, intellectual disabilities, men, women, children, and and this protest gives this space for people. And Muhammad al ajlouni in this protest felt like he's part of this space. And so by attacking him, by attacking this protest, Israel doesn't just prevent us from fulfilling or from implementing our right to freedom of expression, but it also kills a communal way of freedom, of, of expressing ourselves, of raising our voice. 
Thank you, Badur. Um, we've got a, another question, and this is from Louise in New York. Um, and she asks, is there really a difference between the Israeli authorities and settlers when people like Yonatan Yosef can begin his career as a spokesperson for settlers in Sheikh Jarrah and now, I think, works in the council on yeah. granting permission for Palestinian building permits? Uh, very good question. And that's one of the things that really irks me is that all the time we hear the term settler violence as if the settlers are separate from the government or the state. Uh, we're talking about, first of all, it's a, it's a settler colonial regime. Israel is a settler colonial regime. And again, the only differences that can, we can find is sometimes the, the police wants to monopolize the use of violence because it's a police, because it's the state, but they don't disagree over strategy. They only may disagree over tactics. And the, the example that she gave, Yonatan Youssef or Bingvir or others, Bingvir lives in the colony in Kiryat Arba near Al Khalil near Hebron. Uh, the, settler, the settlers in Beta, uh, in Jabal Sabih, the, the Beta village, Beta, Beta is a village that has been protesting against an illegal Israeli colonial outpost that was planted there in, in May. So these settlers were supported by the government. The government is thinking of awarding them the Palestinian land and Beta by declaring them, intentionally declaring it as a state land, as a way of awarding it to settlers. So no, you can't, you can definitely not uh, separate the settlers from the state. The settlers are part and parcel of the state. They're financially supported by it. They're incentivized by the state. They're, they're just such an important part of the state. We have the Il Ad, the Found Settlement Foundation in Silwan, which runs the national park in Silwan, parts of the national park there. It is also supported by the state. Its projects are supported by the state. So they are one and the same, and it's very dangerous to try and to portray the settlers as the extremists and the state as the rational part. It's not. They're one and the same. Well, but it's interesting you're saying all of that because, of course, this week we learned something else because we um, we had the revelation that um, in terms of, uh, you know, permission to build for Palestinians, the occupation authorities have apparently in area C of the West Bank granted Palestinians just 33 building permits over the five-year period 2017 to 2021. 33 building permits. And this is actually apparently information that came from the Israeli Deputy Defence Minister, which struck me as being an odd source for, for this for housing information. But this data also showed uh, that between 2016 and 2020, 99.1% 1 of Palestinian requests for building permits were rejected. I mean, that is absolutely staggering, isn't it? So settlements can be built at whim uh, in occupied Palestinian territory for Israeli settlers. Palestinians have virtually no chance of getting permission to build a house in their own land. land. On their own land. And it's uh, you said Area C. Area C constitutes 60% of the total area of the overall area of the West Bank. It's under full Israeli control, administrative control and military control, meaning that in order for Palestinians to build, they will have to acquire Israeli permits. They can't. if they And if they build without permit, of course, Israel can destroy. And Israel has uh, enacted all sorts of new military orders and legislations in order to speed up the demolition of Palestinians structures, including caravans, including mobile structures, not just house. We're talking also about tents. We're talking, there is one example of a school, Mark. It's a tent school, not really a school that was built in the West Bank and Israel wanted to demolish it. And the, 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 at where I work at JLAC, like we managed to acquire an injunction not to demolish the school. But the only way we managed to acquire the injunction is by saying that there will be no restoration. And then rain came, rain fell, and the school, the, the school, the administration of the school, talking about a tent of two rooms, they were not even allowed to uh, to, to correct or to, uh, to do, to mend the leaks, because anything that they might do or might uh, restore in the school might make them vulnerable to demolition. So it's it's the way that Palestinians live, that even schools, Palestinians, even if they build tent schools for the pupils, 
they can't do it and they are vulnerable to demolition. While you have these settlers who go uh, at 12, go take their sheep probably, or uh, take uh, a, build a caravan and turn it into a yeshiva or into a synagogue or whatever. And then they say, this outpost is ours and then come and retroactively legalize it for us. And this is this is broad daylight theft, really. But it's something that has been going for decades. And, and it's one of those occasions, Mark, when you see how we've been saying we've been feeling it. It's been we've been saying this about this discrimination, this huge difference between building permits being granted to settlers versus -vis those being not being granted to Palestinians. And it's something that we knew. But when you see the numbers, it shocks you again and again that just to see how this brutality is being quantifiable through numbers. So it's not it's not just our hunch that we think it's like this. It's something that can be proven. It's there is an evidence in the numbers. And as they say, and especially in this case, sometimes they do, but in this case, numbers really do not lie. Numbers say numbers just capture part of the truth of Israel's apartheid settler colonial regime over mm -hmm. all of the Palestinians people and, and but there's there's almost um a remorseless uh, and horrendous logic to this a process that could over time uh, eventually see palestinians corralled into smaller and smaller places very small parcels of territory you know very much like um south africa again when the mm -hmm. vast majority of the population were assigned citizenship in bits of the of tiny bits of arid territory that they've never even been to, like the Trans Sky or the Cis Sky. It really does have that feel about it. But look, there's another question we've got. This is from uh, Ben in Stockport. Um, and Ben says, um, according uh, to the Association for Civil Rights in Israel, 72% of all Palestinian families in Jerusalem live below the poverty line compared to 26% of Israeli families, 81% of the Palestinian children in Jerusalem live below the poverty line compared to 36% of Israeli Jewish children. I mean, that really is another stark reminder of uh, the terrible division. But look, we are sadly beginning to run out of time. So I wanted to just briefly go beyond uh, Jerusalem, because of course, also, we've been learning about the plight of the Bedouin in the Negev, um, where we're hearing stories of what well, it is described over here as greenwashing, when all sorts of uh, claims are made about fantastic environmental initiatives that are being launched, and then you you scrub away at it and you realize it's a lot of greenwash. With the Bedouin, it appears that they're in the way of some tree plantations that uh, is, uh, the Israeli government wants to plant. And with the case of Christians in Jerusalem, uh, the expansion, which you briefly touched on, of a park into Christian uh, Orthodox areas. So it's a kind of, um, it's a treble whammy, really, almost wherever you are. Uh, you know, you Everywhere. can't Everywhere. Um, and you are being forced out. What, what, tell us more about the Bedouin and also the Christian uh, Christians in um, Jerusalem. You know, I think you can sum it really up the greenwashing is a good term of it it's something that again it's it's something that's led by the jewish national fund the jnf and it's it's, it's under the guise of a forestation project but it's a forestation quote unquote project that aims of replacing the indigenous population, the indigenous Palestinian Bedouin population of the area of, we're talking in the Naqab, especially we're talking about the, the tribes of Sa'wa and Al-Atrash, uh, who are the ancestral owners of these lands, and then planting trees and then preventing them of how from building there and it's something and then concentrating you talked about concentration people this is the plan for the area for the southern palestine we're talking about the area that exists in southern palestine this is the plan there is to focus to condense all the palestinian bedouin mm. in uh not really you can't even call them cities because they're so underdeveloped to forcibly urbanize them 
to forcibly, uh, Israel calls it to civilize them, but we all know what civilize mean when a colonial power does it. It's this for forcible urbanization of the population by uprooting them from their traditional way of living, from their traditional uh, lives, from their traditional villages, and then putting them uh, in, in these uh, horrible looking cities and then say that we are civilizing them. So this is what's happening. And this is why the protests erupted in Sa'wa al Atrash in the Naqab against these forestation people again recognized just as they recognized during protests against the Praver plan which was a plan in 2013 that also aimed at displacing uh, people who live in villages that Israel has stripped of recognition of displacing them so people were aware of that and this is why they were protesting against the JNF and they said it has nothing to do with green with forestation or with fighting climate change or with making the area greener it just has everything to do with forcibly erasing the Palestinian Bedouin identity of this land and planting settlers and planting non-native trees on our ruins. That's regarding what happened, what's happening in the in southern Palestine, in, in the Naqab. On the other hand, the National Park, we're talking about a national park that was established in 1968, uh, shortly after the annexation and occupation of the eastern part of Jerusalem. Uh, again, it's it's the old city park. It's called the Walls or the, the Walled National Park. And it's in a park who's, uh, that, that reach covers an area of 1,075 uh, dunams. And Israel plans to expand it by 285 dunams and these dunams will mainly are on the slopes of the Mount of Olives that contains some of the most sacred and beautiful Christian Orthodox churches this what this is what led three the three uh, religious uh, main religious churches in Jerusalem the Orthodox the Greek Orthodox Church the Catholic Church and the Armenian Church to send a letter to the Israeli Minister of Environment and to send a letter to different councils to demand and an end to this uh, plan because they know very well that while this plan is covered or colored as if it wants to restore the area, the main aim of this plan is, as, as always has been the case with national parks, since 1948, national park has been a tactic by Israel in order to strip Palestinians of their land and in order to Judaize the land. And this is no difference. What's more that, the, as I said, the national park, most of the national park in the area of Mount of Olives and in Silwan mainly, in, in Wadi Hilwe in Silwan, is managed by the El Ad Settler Foundation, which is supported by the government which we're talking about and this uh, Il Ad foundation is also pushing for a cable car plan another plan that is also threatening christian churches and also uh, threatening palestinian houses and threatening the whole ecology and the whole ecosystem in jerusalem so you see you have all these plans together the expansion of the national park the building the construction of the cable car other oh, every day we hear about a new settlement project colonial project being planned in different parts of Jerusalem, in addition to all these laws in the enactment of different laws, different regulations. The end aim, the end objective of these plans is to faster, to speed up the displacement of Palestinians and to further Judaize, to entrench the Judaization of Jerusalem uh, in particular and all of Palestine in general and this is why I, I said that it's done slowly but very 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 dangerously well look thank you Badur and unfortunately we are kind of reaching the end of um, today's uh, show um, I, but before we go I mean I just briefly return if I may to current events mm -hmm. um, and how um, Palestinians uh, and their supporters around the world can actually um, use them really to illustrate a wider point, which is effectively what we've been discussing earlier, the de facto annexation of the Donbass by Russia, eastern Ukraine, some provinces, parts of provinces. Um, the global, the world has almost reacted as one in condemning this. It's against international law, the Russians should withdraw, and all of that, all the rest of it. The Secretary General of the United Nations has spoken out, just about everybody has spoken out uh, against this. Um, now, one might say that when the Russians have done this before in Chechnya and Transnistria and other places, uh, for different reasons, there was no noise at all. In fact, some countries were quite supportive of it, but that's beside the point. This is seen as a potential occupation. 
So given that you have this experience of occupation um, in the in the newly occupied territories, I mean, you've had, as you would say, settler colonialism since the 1940s, since uh, the division of, uh, of Palestine. Mm -hmm. But, you know, with Golan in particular, how can you use this example of occupation to say, treat these occupations the same? They're all illegal under international law. You need to condemn senators, congressmen, congresswomen, members of parliament, newspapers, all of you. You need to be as condemnatory of what's gone on in Golan and the West Bank and what have you as you are in uh, the Donbass. Can you... Can you use this more effectively, do you think, to educate people? It's a shame, especially in the Golan, in the, in the Golan mark, that it has not received, even when Trump declared, you know, there is a settlement that will be called after Trump in the Golan, that is really <laughs> uh, When Trump declared the unilateral and the recognition, the United States recognition of the Golan as Israeli land, it's, again, we, we return to what Balfour did, that someone who owned, did not own the land recognized it and give it to someone who also do, does not own it and it's it's really very important it's one issue that has been so underreported like while what happens in Jer jerusalem and the west bank and even palestine 48 relatively at least gets attention the uh, the wind farm project in the golan the attempt to uh, approve and to double the number of Israeli settlers in the Golan. All the daily violences, and I call it daily violences because they're probably, again, not as visible as what happens in the West Bank, but they're daily perpetrated against Syrians. The theft, the exploitation and extractivism of their resources. I mean, any, any movement fighting against climate change, for instance, and fighting against the greenwashing, and fighting against extractivism and exploitation should make the fight Fight, the Syrian fight in the Golan, it's priority because what's happened there is extractivism and it should be fought. Corporations that are complicit in the extractivism of gas and again in the exploitation of natural resources in the Golan should be boycotted. Of course, we, in, in BDS, we boycott all Israeli products, but there, there really should be more focus on supporting. There are several activists who work on the Golan who try to report. Unfortunately, they've, they, they, they almost sometimes scream in the dark because no one is willing to listen to them. And also, I, I shall add, to be honest, that even the Syrian uh, dictatorship doesn't seem to care about the Golan. So it's, it's as if the Syrians in the Golan are left, are abandoned by everyone. So it is our, but but they are definitely part and parcel of the wider struggle for liberation in Palestine. They're always there with us in Palestinian protests, and we are also with there in their protests and in their demands for dignity and liberation. This is what they want. So it's really important. Again, highlighting the hypocrisy is important, in my opinion. It's not an a, a what about three. I think it's it's very important to highlight the hypocrisy to call it for what it is because you can't condemn annexation and occupation in some place and then support it in another this is really important and again being part of this uh, struggle to boycott all Israeli products including what Israel is doing in the Golan including holding it accountable and reporting and writing about it. it's it's a great opportunity again it's the 40th anniversary of the open ended strike in the Golan it's a great opportunity to read stories of what happened in February 1982 because I argue that what happened in the Golan in 1982, this massive popular disobedience, civil disobedience movement really is what planted the seeds for the first intifada and for the civil disobedience for the civil intifada. So these are twin struggles, the struggle in the Golan, the struggle in Palestine. And I, I'm glad that at least in your show, we were able to highlight how intricately tied these two struggles, whether for the liberation of the Golan or the liberation of Palestine are. Thank you, Badur. Um, and finally, JC Hoot says, uh, thank you very much for this enlightening discussion. And Sanjida says, it sounds like Israel is building a holiday destination by stealing Palestinian land. Well, yes, we couldn't have said it better ourselves. Thank you, Sanjida. And thank you very much indeed, Badur. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely fantastic. Great to have you on. Um, we wish you uh, all the very best, all good luck with all of your very, very important work. Um, and uh, we want to keep in touch uh, and we want to see you back here soon with us on Palestine Deep Dive. 
So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all for sending in your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, but from all of us at Palestine Deep Dive and from the team, uh, thank you. And until next time, it's goodbye from Badur and goodbye from me.